Okay. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Collins. I am the Executive Director of the Public Health Institute of Western Mass and we are thrilled to have you all with us today to learn about this very important topic um, about the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, I'm honored to introduce our esteemed panel. We have State Senator Eric Lesser of First Hamden and Hampshire District. We have Dr. Sarah Hessler, the hospital epidemiologist at Bay State Medical Center, Vice Chair for Clinical Affairs at the Department of Medicine, University of Massachusetts Medical School at Bay State. We also have Dr. Amanda Westlake, who is an infectious disease specialist at Bay State Mason Square Neighborhood Health Center. And she's also the Assistant Professor of Medicine at University of Massachusetts Medical School. And she will be answering questions on the live stream as we uh, have our program. And lastly, uh, Associate Commissioner of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, Lindsay Tucker, uh, will also be joining us. So thank you everyone for being here. And um, first, I wanna start with you, Senator Lesser. Thank you so much for being with us today. I know you have a lot to share. Thank you, can, can everybody hear me okay? And everybody can see me okay? All right, good, a requisite Zoom check. But uh, I, first, I want to thank you, Jessica. Um, you're a, a great friend and partner and colleague on so many issues, uh, food insecurity, um, certainly, of course, public health and, and all of the uh, attendant items that are related to public health. So I want to thank you and I want to thank the Public Health Institute of Western Mass. We just had a great uh, live stream uh, with Dr. Kathleen Zegda, which was really informative and we shared your uh, dashboard uh, for Hamden County and for Western Mass. So people can definitely check that out. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Hessler and Dr. Westlake. And I want to thank uh, Lindsay Tucker from the Mass Department of Public Health for really heroic efforts over the last year. Um, Look, this has been a hard, a hard year for everyone, but I do think there's, of course, light uh, at the end of the tunnel here as we see that the vaccines do work. Uh, you know, the, the data that came out of Israel, I think, is encouraging. It's gotten a lot of uh, press coverage. The, the key challenge, I think, for us right now is going to be making sure that the vaccine is distributed in an equitable and speedy way, uh, and certainly that our communities in Western Mass are, are not left out of that. So. Uh, we've been working uh, very aggressively uh, as a delegation to really keep vaccine equity front and center uh, in the state's decision making and policy making. Uh, we have in particular concerns about uh, equity in terms of distribution of the vaccine in Western Mass. So a group of legislators, including Joe Comerford, Mindy Dom, uh, Adam Gomez, uh, and multiple other members of the Hamden County delegation have been working together both to ensure that adequate doses are brought to Western Mass and are specifically uh, uh, earmarked, so to speak, for Western Mass and for our most at-risk communities, but also that we're being mindful about the distribution and the mechanisms for accessing the vaccine. So just in particular, something we've been very focused on is the online only system uh, does not work. Uh, we need a phone option. The governor actually just announced about 15 minutes ago uh, that a new 211 line is going to be open uh, after several weeks of us pushing for that. Uh, and it's going to be right now in English and in Spanish with live callers. Uh, and then there'll be as many as 100, I believe, languages uh, able to be translated from that. Uh, the other thing we need to do is we need to dramatically simplify the website. Uh, right now, the, the mass.gov COVID website is just too confusing. Uh, there's too many links. There's too many places people have to go to uh, to navigate where and how to get their appointment, uh, especially for the target uh, demographic here, 75 or older, uh, not always great with computers. And it's also worth pointing out that we have significant digital divides both in our urban areas, uh, but also many rural communities that don't have broadband access uh, at all. So we, they've got to do more uh, to streamline uh, that system and we've been pushing that. And then something Dr. Zegda and I talked about uh, on our live stream, uh, which is very much a priority of our delegation is changing the mindset around the vaccine right now. Um, the, the centralized uh, mass vaccine sites are are great, they're important for just speed and getting as many doses out as possible. But right now the state is very much approaching this with the mindset of bringing people to the vaccine. Whereas we need to be very mindful and deliberate about bringing the vaccine to the people. Uh, and that means things like mobile vaccination sites. It means 
um, localizing the vaccine distribution, getting it into our community health centers, working with trusted local partners in a culturally competent way uh, to get the vaccine out. So there are a lot of things we don't control uh, about the COVID-19 vaccine. Obviously, uh, we are at the mercy of the federal government in terms of the number of doses we get. Uh, but we can be very mindful and we can be frankly aggressive about the advocacy that we undertake once the vaccines arrive in Massachusetts, how they're distributed, how we get them into people's arms. So you're the best in the business at doing this, uh, uh, the Public Health Institute of Western Mass. So just really want to say thank you to all of you. And I'll, I'll pitch it back over to you, uh, Jessica, so that you can stop hearing from the elected officials and start hearing from the experts. Uh, but I, I do just want to lift up and thank uh, everybody on this call who's worked so hard and a real shout out to, to the to the to the medical teams uh, at, at Bay State at Mercy at our community health centers that have just been on the front line of this for a year now. Uh, it's really been a year over a year since the first case was recorded in Massachusetts. So um, just again can't thank you enough and uh, you're going to be important uh, leaders for us in this new phase of, of vaccination and recovery. Senator Lessar, thank you so much. I uh, so appreciate you giving that broad background and all the themes that are really going to affect Western Mass's ability to do this well and do it equitably. And I am just, I'm very grateful for your leadership and for your advocacy. So thank you so much for spending uh, this time with us today. Um, next, I would like to welcome um, Dr. Sarah Hessler who will be doing a presentation and also answering questions. And before I um, uh, let her speak, I also wanna just say thank you to the other elected officials that have joined us today. If you are on live stream, we appreciate you being with us. So uh, Dr. Hessler. Great, thanks. So um, speaking of technology, I'm gonna to try to share my screen now. So hopefully, oh, so somebody has to allow me to share my screen, it's disabled. So whoever the host is, if you could allow me, that would be great, thanks. All right, let's see if this works now. And yeah, Dr. Hessler, I just wanna say also, thank you so much for your leadership throughout this entire pandemic. All uh, right. That you so, have shared your expertise. Thank you. So somebody else is still sharing their screen. So let's see if I can get to mine. Okay, let's see my desktop, share. Let's see if this works. <laughs> Okay, hopefully this will go. If not, we'll take somebody else on and uh, <laughs> let's see. Here we go, share. Okay, can you all see this now? Great, okay. Well, you know, technology is <laughs> challenging, so, um, but also miraculous. Um, and so I just wanna spend a few minutes just giving people an update on um, vaccinations. Uh, so this is who I am. Here's an overview of what we're gonna talk about today. So um, I'll, I'll uh, share with you, how do these vaccinations work? Um, how were they developed so quickly? Uh, usually they take years, right? Um, are they safe? Uh, what are the side effects? And um, are there medical contraindications or conditions that would prevent someone from getting vaccinated? Um, can pregnant people get vaccinated? And um, can we stop wearing masks once we're vaccinated? So those will be the main themes of my talk today. Uh, and again, I'm happy to entertain any uh, questions at the end if we have time. And I know Dr. Westlake will be entertaining questions from you in the chat uh, room if you have um, things that um, come up while I'm talking. Okay, so the um, work to uh, create the um, vaccinations for um, COVID-19 um, were really uh, built on prior, um, prior work on SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV. So SARS-CoV was the virus that caused SARS and MERS-CoV is Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And uh, these are uh, both coronaviruses and um, they have very similar uh, functions. And so the, that prior work to try to um, develop vaccinations for those two diseases were what enabled us to uh, quickly identify the target. So so the spike protein on the surface of the 
virus is what allows us to, um, allows the virus here to bind onto our cells. And then uh, in here, uh, once it binds on, it enters into the cell and it releases its little virus in there. And then the virus takes hold of our cell um, machinery to make more of itself and then um, uh, replicates within us. And so um, that spike protein um, is a great target for a vaccination because if we can target the outside of that um, virus, it will and prevent um, the virus from accessing our cells. We can prevent ourselves from getting infected with it. Um, so let's see. All right. So um, the mRNA vaccinations actually have been um, under investigation for decades. And this is a really fantastic story of a, a Hungarian immigrant named um, Katalin Kariko. Uh, this is a, a scientist who was working at University of Pennsylvania uh, who was trying to develop mRNA vaccinations for decades. So mRNA is a very temporary um, signal that the that the um, body, the cells use. So the nucleus translates a um, piece of DNA, which is instructions uh, to make a protein. And, um, the, and it makes it into a thing called messenger RNA. The messenger RNA comes out of the nucleus and goes into the cytoplasma of the cell. Ribosomes um, catch on to that mRNA and they translate it into a protein. And that's that's how this works to grow all kinds of things for your body, to make hair cells and more uh, intestinal cells and other things like that. So the idea around an mRNA uh, vaccination was uh, very attractive because this is a very temporary molecule. It doesn't enter the um, the nucleus, and um, and wouldn't that be great to just be able to have the instructions for the one thing that you want? The problem is that mRNA is destroyed really quickly after it's used. Otherwise, it would build up inside your cells. So it's used and then destroyed. So um, how could you possibly get a mRNA into the body? That was the challenge. And so this person worked tirelessly since 1990. When, and she was actually demoted at Penn because she didn't come up with any results. But finally, in 2005, she figured it out about how to insert mRNA into cells. And that was around um, putting these lipid nanoparticles around the um, mRNA, which stabilized it and allowed it to um, be um, uh, stable long enough to get engulfed by the cells. And then it releases inside the cells. And then the RNA uh, is, the, I'm sorry, the mRNA is translated like any other mRNA into the spike protein. So this scientist now works for um, BioNTech, which is the German company that partnered with Pfizer to create the first vaccination, the mRNA vaccination to receive emergency use authorization um, in, the, in the United States. So it's a very heartwarming story and I'm grateful to all of the work that she put in uh, in order to, to help us uh, get a jump start on creating these vaccinations. So how did they get approved so quickly? Well, the trials were overseen by the NIH, which is uh, National Institutes of Health, uh, which allowed them to start faster and also to coordinate the trials so that the endpoints were all the same so they could compare them kind of head to head. And then they used this concept of Operation Warp Speed, which was federal funding for this. So the most can promising candidate vaccinations were um, received government funding to help them to, to do the clinical trials and to actually start manufacturing the vaccines before the trials were even over so that if they were successful, we'd have them ready to go. Um, so this is a timeline here that you can see, which um, shows, demonstrates all the way back in 2002 and three, when SARS-CoV was identified that these efforts were used to develop the um, trials for, um, for uh, coronavirus vaccinations. Then in December of two, we'll jump forward to December of 2019 when the first cases uh, appeared in China. By um, January of 2020, 
um, they had published the genetic sequence of this virus, which was really uh, miraculous. And then uh, multiple pharmaceutical companies um, um, started creating prototypes for, um, for vaccinations using that genetic sequence. Multiple different companies started down different pathways. There are um, other uh, technologies besides mRNA vaccinations in order to um, create these. And some other pharmaceutical companies like Johnson & Johnson, for example, which is uh, probably next up, um, is using a different technology. It's not mRNA, it's an adenovirus vector. So there's multiple different um, ways of getting the, um, the vaccine to work. And so um, these pharmaceutical companies uh, started down these pathways and the most promising candidates received additional funding in order to um, be able to ramp up their production and get their clinical trials done. So you see that by November, their, um, their preliminary data was strong enough for them to go in front of the FDA in order to seek emergency use authorization. Oops. There we go. All right, so how do we know if these um, vaccines are safe? Well, they did very large clinical trials on them to ensure that the vaccinations achieved the safety standards that we um, demand in the United States. Um, they the FDA reviewed all of this safety data and then they authorized through an emergency use authorization when the um, benefits of the, um, of the product outweigh the risks. Then additionally, there's a separate process, it's separate but related um, by the ACIP, which is the Advisory Council on Immunization Practices. And this is an independent body that is commissioned by the CDC to um, advise them on the safety of um, and schedules of various vaccinations. This is a body that's been in place for decades. Um, and uh, anybody that um, administers vaccines or looks up stuff about vaccine will see these schedules around when are you supposed to get a vaccine at 18 months and at you know three years or at two, right? And so the ACIP is the one that makes all of those recommendations recommendations. And this is made up of, um, of data scientists, infectious disease specialists, vaccinologists, and people that are experts in vaccine development. Um, and so they um, pick through all of the data. They look for um, any signals that make them concerned that this wouldn't be safe for use or that it wouldn't be effective or not worth the, um, the risk. And um, so they also independently reviewed the data and they would then make a recommendation to the CDC about giving um, approval or not for uh, vaccinating um, or using that, approving that vaccination. Um, and then further, and, and they did, by the way. So the FDA uh, um, reviewed all of the data and it, I've, <laughs> I've reviewed the data. It's pages and pages and pages of data around um, every single thing that they did in these clinical trials to ensure uh, that they understood the safety uh, and the efficacy of the, of the vaccinations. Um, and so then there are multiple systems in place in the United States to monitor for vaccine side effects and for any signal that there may be um, uh, harm happening or, um, you know, when you roll out a vaccination to a much larger population than the, um, than the clinical trial size, that's when you would start to see very rare side effects. And so these monitoring systems are looking for a signal. Is there any increase in something else, right? So everybody remembers the swine flu vaccine from the uh, mid 1970s, where they saw Guillain-Barre follow, but only much later in much larger populations. And so that's what vaccine monitoring systems are for, is to look for signals in the data. And um, as of, you know, as of today, there have been no signals that indicate that this vaccination has uh, caused any major safety signals or anything of concern, apart from a lot of the side effects that we're going to talk about, and a few cases of anaphylaxis. Uh, and again, the anaphylaxis is um, something that, that uh, occurs sporadically radically to people for um, you know, usually unknown reasons. It's an allergy. It's very rare. And that is why um, there is the requirement to monitor people after they receive the dose. So people um, who are receiving a dose of the vaccination are required to be monitored for 15 minutes after their vaccination or 30 minutes if, if they've ever had a bad reaction to a vaccine in the past. Um, so there's lots of safety guardrails up around these um, vaccinations, which I think should reassure sure all of us. 
So here's some um, data around the phase three trials. So that's um, the large scale clinical trials. So the two that are currently um, in use by, um, uh, by emergency use authorization are the Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna vaccines. And you can see that they included um, adults. Uh, they included adults with both stable conditions and multiple chronic um, conditions. They excluded people um, who had um, COVID-19 um, in the Pfizer uh, BioNTech uh, trial. They um, had 20,000 get the vaccine and 20,000 get placebo in the Pfizer BioNTech. The Moderna had 15,000 people get a vaccine and 15,000 get a placebo. Um, and then they were fairly evenly distributed from uh, between male and female participants. Um, and the um, uh, you can see the uh, racial makeup of the people that received vaccinations, as well as uh, the age and um, you know some other uh, uh, background demographic factors, just so that you can understand that there was a wide range of people. These weren't all uh, you know twenty-year-old healthy college student volunteers that some trials have, and that would make them not widely applicable to the general population. And I think that what the take home message from, from this slide is that there was a wide representation of people in these trials from age, racial makeup, um, as well as um, having underlying medical conditions. So um, this is my favorite um, um, graph really ever. <laughs> this is called a Kaplan-Meier curve. And um, in medicine, we almost, we essentially, let's just say, we never see curves this good. This is incredible. It's really phenomenal. So the red line, this is from the Pfizer trial. So the red line represents the people that got the, um, the, uh, the Pfizer bio and tech vaccination. And, um, and the blue line represents the people that got the placebo. And what the dots represent Present are the people that got um, COVID-19 over time after they got vaccinated, all right? So what you can see from this is that the curves coincide with each other. They just track really nicely. Everybody's still getting COVID for, the, for, for about the first two weeks. But you see that by day 14, and they magnified this nicely for you. That's what the magnified box is. They magnified to show you where the curves start to diverge, all right? So really about 10 days after the first dose is when we start as when in the trials, they started to see that people that got the vaccination really stopped getting COVID. And the people that got the placebo just kept getting it and getting it and getting it. <laughs> and um, it's amazing. We never see this kind of difference between a uh, placebo and a, um, and a treatment in, in medicine. The curves are always just slightly different and everybody starts to argue, really, is that clinically um, effective? Is that really impactful? Should we really be using this drug? But this is really remarkable. And the, the Moderna um, cap and Meyer curves were um, essentially a mirror image or an you know, exact replica of this. The, the results were uh, basically exactly the same. So what can you expect after getting vaccinated? Well, there were a lot of side effects in, uh, noted in the trial. There are, there, um, the side effects are predominantly um, sore arm. Almost everybody who gets um, the vaccination will have a sore arm. It's generally uh, relatively short-lived. The, um, the vaccine itself really does not hurt. I, I can tell you that by personal experience because I've been vaccinated and I've been a vaccinator at our vaccine site. And everybody that I've vaccinated said, are you sure? You you're done. That I didn't even feel that, and so um, it's for those who are needle phobic or scared of the pain of the vaccine. The the vaccine itself really doesn't hurt going in. The soreness comes uh, eight, 10, 12 hours later. People start to feel the sore. They realize, ooh, there it is. And you know, lots of people experience this after getting a flu shot, after getting a tetanus booster, etc. Um, a smaller number of people, so about eighty percent of people, have a sore arm. 
So about um, much smaller number, somewhere between 20 and 40% of people have been getting a more robust um, response. And this is a, um, a, what we call reactogenicity. So them just reacting to this vaccine. It's the immune system activating saying, wow, there's something different in me. That's not me. I better react to that. And so it responds. And what it does is what it knows how to do, which is cause a little fever, some chills, tiredness, little headache, achiness, body aches, joint pains. And these things last usually a day or less. And again, less than half of the people that get vaccinated have been getting these side effects. I think it's really helpful to know what to expect and to know that they might happen to you. You can take some um, uh, analgesics if you are experiencing um, you know, a, a lot of these symptoms to make you more comfortable. So acetaminophen, ibuprofen um, are, are good choices to, um, to help with those symptoms. Um, the symptoms um, do go away usually after a day or two. Um, there's uh, very rare cases of people having a little longer um, effect. The, um, the uh, side effects are, tend to be um, more pronounced after the second dose than the first dose. But again, these are uh, you know mostly what you expect with um, lots of other vaccinations. Um, so why are vaccines the best choice? Why don't you just wait it out and see, or why don't we all just, you know, kind of uh, this, this theory of, can we get herd immunity by just everybody getting COVID? So those are not good strategies. And I'll tell you why, because um, people who get COVID have a, uh, you know, a really high risk of morbidity and mortality from COVID. It's a, it's not a good disease to get. It's not, as you may have heard in some um, circles, just the flu. It's not just the flu, uh, especially in our vulnerable populations. It can cause a lot of morbidity and certainly mortality. And in this region, we have had, um, unfortunately, many lost lives due to COVID-19. Um, and so um, the vaccine nation, on the other hand, has the opportunity to uh, create um, immunity through vaccine and prevent us from getting infected and prevent us from having the um, morbidity and mortality. It's certainly um, a lot safer to get vaccinated um, with knowing that there are just minor side effects associated with it than it is to take your chances uh, and get infected with COVID-19. Um, the other uh, obvious and most important factor here is that the more people that get vaccinated, the, more, the closer we get to herd immunity and the closer we get to having going back to a life where we can uh, see our family and friends uh, and, uh, you know, return to, um, you know, pre-pandemic uh, um, activities. So what about uh, pregnant people? Should, should they get vaccinated? So there's been a lot of concern because uh, pregnant people were excluded from the clinical trials. However, <laughs> there were many people that became pregnant during the clinical trial and they are being followed very actively. And in addition, since the um, vaccination has been um, approved through emergency use authorization, uh, many, many, many pregnant people have been um, vaccinated. So um, this is a decision that um, is uh, a personal one. The, um, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, ACOG, recommends that, um, that pregnant people uh, should be considered for vaccination, that they should um, not be um, excluded from opportunities to be vaccinated and should not have to undergo uh, testing or proof or anything. Uh, they should just be offered the vaccination and they can make their own um, decision. Um, and so uh, there are um, decision tools out there. Here's an example of an excellent decision tool that uh, our own Dr. Elizabeth Schoenfeld and multiple colleagues um, at Bay State worked on uh, to to help people really um, think through and talk through with their family, friends, and provider uh, what is the risk and what is the benefit of, um, of receiving the vaccination if um, the uh, person is pregnant or uh, wishes to become pregnant in the future. So the next question that we receive a lot is, are there um, contraindications or people with medical conditions that should prevent them from getting the vaccination? 
I did not include this slide because I wanted people to try to read tiny fine print. I included it because this comes from the CDC where they created a nice, really helpful decision tool uh, for people to, um, to decide whether or not they should um, avoid getting the um, vaccine. And we'll start here in the um, bottom right-hand corner without the red allergies, okay? Really the only people on this um, chart that says contraindications to vaccines are people who have had a severe allergic reaction to um, any component of the COVID-19 vaccine, right? And so that's basically almost nobody. <laughs> Those are the only people that have a real contraindication. And even then it's not a true real contraindication. What it means is that those people should be seen by an allergist um, and, uh, and uh, have a, again, a risk benefit discussion about having a second dose. So then everybody else is either in this um, uh, yellow column or a green column. So there are conditions and allergies um, in the two boxes. Um, and what you can see is that um, people who have um, currently uh, who are you know, sick with a moderate to severe acute illness should get a risk assessment and probably defer the vaccination just because they're sick. <laughs> and why introduce something that might cause side effects probably de defer that the vaccination. Then in the um, allergies, people with an immediate allergic reaction to any kind of um, uh, other vaccination um, should undergo a risk assessment. And these are the people that are getting observed for 30 minutes rather than 15 minutes. You move over to the um, green box and it's basically everybody else. Everybody else should be offered a vaccination and be monitored for 15 minutes. And I think that this is just really helpful to think through. Almost nobody shouldn't get offered a vaccination. Okay, so um, once I'm vaccinated and fully vaccinated, do I still have to wear a mask? Can I, can I, um, <laughs> can I take it off now? And can I start you know, um, uh, seeing people closer than six feet? The answer is no, you cannot, or yes, you still have to wear your mask and physically distance after getting vaccinated. Um, so these are safety precautions. Um, as the vaccination rolls out, the majority of the population still is, um, is not protected and there's still very high rates of, um, of virus circulating in our community. Um, and this is gonna be so until we get to the point where we have enough people that are immune that their rates drop down. At base state health, we're still seeing, you know, 50 to 100 new positive um, tests per every day. And we do about a third of the testing in the region. So triple that number and you'll get how many new people are still being diagnosed in our region with, with COVID on a daily basis. This is not gone, it's still happening. And so we need to continue to practice these safety precautions until we have a much higher level of immunity in the population. Um, also, the vaccination, um, as you saw on that Kaplan-Meier curve, it takes a while to develop immunity. So after 10 to 14 days is when we start to see a divergence in the curves but the full protection really doesn't occur until about um, two weeks after the second dose is when the immune response is, is finished doing its job and you've got the maximum that you're gonna get. So the bottom line is even though you're vaccinated, you still need to wear your mask, stay six feet apart, avoid crowds and wash your hands um, very frequently. And alcohol hand rub, yes, is um, as good if not better than um, hand um, uh, washing with soap and water. So this is a nice schematic that just shows um, uh, what I was talking about in terms of a, um, of a uh, concept, right? So this is Swiss cheese, right? So there's lots of little holes in Swiss cheese, but um, occasionally a hole in the Swiss cheese can line up and go all the way through, right? So this is why you need to have multiple layers of protection in order to uh, prevent um, you know, COVID-19. So um, important um, layers of this include the physical distancing, the hand hygiene, mask wearing, avoiding crowds. And you see that vaccinations are the last layer of protection within this Swiss cheese model. I also wanna point out that tiny little mouse that's in there, okay? What is the mouse doing? The mouse is chewing new holes. The mouse represents misinformation, okay? And I know that we all we all deal with this on a on a daily basis, but you know, mis 
this information can really undermine a lot of um, the work that we all do in uh, medicine and public health uh, to try to ensure that people have the best information that they understand um, what the benefits are of all of these basic public health practices to protect themselves and their loved ones and their community. So um, this is the last slide, just um, some information on where uh, more uh, details can be found. Um, the CDC has excellent information, the um, mass.gov, um, always up to date, fantastic information. Bay State has a lot of information around our vaccinations and, um, and how you can get a vaccine. Um, at Bay State, Mercy as well has information about how to uh, find a, um, a vaccination. And also, of course, your own personal healthcare provider can, um, can help you to navigate that as well. So with that, I'll stop and, um, and cede the floor. Great, Dr. Hessler, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And I appreciate that you went into the details of the earlier days of the development of the vaccine. I think that's incredibly important for people to understand. This was in the works for decades and that you know science has been uh, truly working on this very hard for a long time. So a couple of questions. You answered many of the questions, but here's a couple. Are you able to speak at all to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, that we're hearing a lot about in the media? Um, so, you know, it's not, um, it's not, it does, has not received emergency use authorization. It's coming. Um, and so I haven't seen, they have not released um, the data for me to actually speak to it with any authority yet. So I'm going to defer on that one uh, just because we don't, I don't have enough information. Um, That's fine. So just for folks out there, we will put all these slides up on our website and as new information like this comes out um, and we get um, more information from folks like Dr. Hessler, we will share that through our website. Um, okay, another one is how long after getting another vaccine, for example, flu or shingles, should someone wait before going for COVID? Great question. Super glad that that one was asked because there is a specific time frame, and it is two weeks, 14 days. So okay. um, if you um, have gotten a flu shot or Shinrix or MMR or Tdap or any of the other um, vaccinations um, out there, the recommendation is to wait two weeks before getting a COVID vaccine. Conversely, <laughs> yeah. if you've gotten a COVID vaccine, you want to wait two weeks before you get one of those other vaccines. Now think about the fact that the COVID vaccines require two doses. So the timing really, you need to think about it if you're gonna get a, like, let's say you wanna get Shinrix, um, which by the way, hurts a lot more and has a lot more side effects than the, <laughs> than the <laughs> COVID vaccine. Um, so uh, the Shin, so if you wanted to get Shinrix you, and you'd already gotten your first dose of COVID, you would wanna wait on the Shinrix, okay? So wait, then you get your second dose of the COVID vaccine because that's gonna be either three or four weeks apart. And then two weeks later, you can start your Shinrix series. Okay, great. And another question, can you speak to children and, and, and why we're not vaccinating children at this time? Sure, it's a great question also. So these um, vaccinations were tested in, um, uh, in the case of the Moderna, uh, ad, um, adults 18 and above were included in the trials and the case of the Pfizer uh, BioNTech, a uh, 16 year old and above were included in the trials. So the emergency use authorization um, is approved for people um, in those age categories. So we don't actually have any clinical data uh, and so they were not approved for use. So. Um, so they're not being rolled out to children yet because they're not even approved. There are, I am aware of clinical trials that are involving children. It's much harder to do a clinical tr trial involving a child. There's a lot of consent issues, parental um, you know, uh, involvement that needs to occur in order to, um, and, and ethical issues obviously, and in including um, children in trials. And so um, they were not included in the original one. So they've not been included um, in the first phases because they're not approved for that age group. Okay, so as more information comes out, we will we will share that we as well. Right, and we yeah. can expect that these things will probably change over time as, as um, the trials are done. And then again, the FDA would then review all the data and make a decision about whether they would be approved um, in a lower age range. 
Okay, great, thank you. Another question regarding uh, new strains and uh, variants. Yeah. Can you speak to that? Yes, we spent a lot of time uh, looking um, at the data on new str new variants, right? Okay, so there are um, multiple different variants of um, the virus that um, are circulating, and that is because viruses um, are very sloppy in their replication. Okay, so as a they, uh, our own cells have a number of um, proofreading uh, functions to them so that when an mRNA comes out of the nucleus and starts getting translated by our ribosomes, there is some proofreading that goes on to make sure that they got it right. <laughs> and if they didn't get it right, they junk that one, okay? But viruses don't have that proofreading stuff. And so when they get translated, sometimes mutations occur because the wrong thing was translated. And so it's a little bit wonky and off, right? And um, if those mutations confer a survival advantage to the virus, mean, meaning it makes it more easily transmitted, you know, more something more for the virus to be passed on more easily, then that virus is going to survive more, right? It's going to be passed mm -hmm. on more. And so these things arise by chance. Um, but if they confer a survival advantage, they create a system um, of, of spreading themselves that is essentially more, right? And so the, uh, the, the main variant that is of concern right now is the UK B117 variant. Okay, so this is a, um, the reason why it was even discovered in the first place is that the United Kingdom leads the globe in, um, in monitoring and doing surveillance of the strains that are circulating in their country. All right, so they, uh, the national health system um, takes a, um, a huge percentage of the strains that they, when they diagnose a patient, they do genome sequencing on it and, and, and are looking for mutations. No other country in the world is looking as hard as the UK mm -hmm. is, okay? And so they started to see a couple months ago this variant emerge, and then they started to see that it was getting more and more and more in their population. And, th and through mathematical modeling is how they figured out that um, it, had be it was something that probably confers greater infectivity because again, mathematically, from the time it appeared in their data until the time it became one of the most dominant strains was X amount of time. So therefore, right, in terms of transmissibility, it was more transmissible than strain, than, than I'm sorry, variants before it. Does that make sense? All right, and so, so that's where the concern about this comes from. Um, that if it's more transmissible and, you know, and we have a population that isn't immune yet, then, you know, we could have even more cases. It could drive even more um, of uh, the pandemic until we can get people to uh, be um, vaccinated and have immunity. The other concern around the variants is um, will they, will one of those survival advantages um, confer resistance to the immunity that the vaccine um, confers, right? Okay, so so everybody's worried about that. The initial data that we have from one of the, um, from the data from the BioNTech um, trial, they took some sera from those people and they challenged it with the um, B117, the UK strain. They found that the antibodies in that sera neutralized that strain just fine. So we're not worried about that one, but there is another strain from, um, from South Africa that, um, that does, I'm um, sorry, variant uh, from South Africa that um, does appear to confer some uh, increased um, immunity to the um, to our vaccinations. So uh, yeah, not exactly confer immunity. I don't mean to say it that way. So uh, <laughs> decrease the amount um, or, or, or evade our immune system, I guess is the, the best way for me to say that. Um, and so uh, we are um, in the United States uh, increasing the amount that we are monitoring for these variant strains. Um, there's a really great new website that the CDC created um, that demonstrates how many cases we have in the United States of each of these variants. 
Um, and they updated it a couple times a week. I don't know if anybody has looked at that one, but it's um, it's really nice to see, and it um, breaks it down by state um, and demonstrates how many um, cases that they've detected in each of the states. So the state departments of public health have um, asked the uh, various um, reference labs in the region, so Bay State uh, Reference Lab being one of them, to send strains to them and they test a random assortment of strains all um, every week. They're testing them uh, through the genome sequencing to detect are we seeing cases of these variants in um, in Massachusetts? Just so that we can keep uh, in front of this and understand, um, do we have anything to be worried about? Oh, okay. So more information to come on that as absolutely well. as that comes out, we will surely post it and be looking for you for for information. Dr. Hessler, I want to say thank you so so I much heard. for your time. This has been incredibly helpful. Um, and sort of a perfect lead in right now to Associate Commissioner Lindsay Tucker, who's joined us to talk about what is going on at the state and what their what their strategies are. So Lindsay, welcome so much. And I know you're going to um, share your slides and take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Jessica, really appreciate the invite and um, excited to be with you all this afternoon. Thank you so much for your time. Um, so just wanted, so I'm Lindsay Tucker. I'm the Associate Commissioner at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. And um, really, uh, again, just appreciate this opportunity to talk to you about uh, the vaccine deployment and rollout. And I hope that I am complementing what has already been stated. I apologize that I wasn't able to be on earlier. Um, so I will go quickly and then hopefully we can have a few time, a few minutes for questions at the end. So next slide, please. Um, I imagine that uh, folks are familiar with this particular graphic, um, but just wanted to spend a minute on it. Uh, so as you know uh, that, oh, sorry, if you could go back, oh, perfect. Um, so the Commonwealth has a phased vaccine rollout, as do most states. Um, Many states, however, have different phasing. And so if you are in touch with uh, friends and family in other states, uh, the uh, timeline and exactly um, who is in which order, uh, the order of priority may be different. Um, and just recognizing that that is um, confusing and perhaps also frustrating. Um, but we have really uh, prioritized um, equity in thinking about uh, the phased rollout here. And uh, phase one is still ongoing while we have also started phase two. Um, so right now, all people in phase one are eligible for a vaccine. This is all healthcare workers, um, both COVID facing and non, and also long-term care facilities, uh, first responders, congregate settings. Uh, that is the space that I personally am spending a lot of time these days uh, working on deployment for uh, shelters and um, congregate settings. This includes correctional facilities um, and then also home-based healthcare workers. And as you may know, this past Monday, uh, phase two started with individuals 75 and over. Um, there are a variety of places where all of those people can be vaccinated, and I will talk about that in a second. Um, but you may be asking, when are we going to get to that next bullet point in phase two? And the answer is uh, soon. So we are, as you may have heard um, from some of the press conferences that the governor and the secretary um, have been saying, we unfortunately uh, do not have as much supply uh, of vaccine as we would like in order to move as quickly as we would like. And so until we um, are able to get more supply into the state, uh, we are not yet going to be moving to open up and activate that second bullet point. Um, but that is something that we are very much uh, looking toward and um, interested in. And one thing that I will flag that is not uh, clear from this language, because this is so high level, um, is that pregnancy is actually on the list as a condition that if you have an additional comorbidity would put you in that category of having two plus comorbidities. Um, so just if you uh, work with pregnant women or, or if you... Um, uh, are in that space, uh, there will be much more information coming to you, uh, but just flagging that uh, because pregnant women who have um, another uh, health indicator um, that would make them in that comorbidity and status, they are eligible in that, in that second bullet point as well. 
Um, and then uh, moving into other workers, um, some really essential and critical workers for keeping um, our, our lives up and running, including early education, daycare, K-12, uh, grocery, food, transit, et cetera. Um, and so uh, really um, looking toward making sure that we are getting enough education and information out for folks. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, we have a lot of information. Oh, the next slide is the priority slide. So I'll, before I talk about the website, um, the vaccine advisory group, uh, which was pulled together in the fall to give us uh, in the administration guidance around um, the prioritization process, uh, we're are in, their, in their guidance really prioritizing these three things. One, preserving the healthcare system, and that's why healthcare workers were really first on that list, uh, making sure that we are able to vaccinate our healthcare workers so that they can continue to support and serve us in all of the ways that they do. Uh, limit severe morbidity and mortality, and then promoting equity. Uh, and so um, really having that be uh, one of the three tenants in, in that phase prioritization process. Um, and as an example there, when we think about uh, folks in the healthcare system, uh, just the example here is not, not, for example, just doctors and nurses, but anybody in that healthcare setting. So including um, janitorial staff, um, home health workers, et cetera. Uh, so thank you. Next slide. Um, we have a lot of information on our website. It's uh, really terrific and also can be a little overwhelming just because of the volume. Um, so wanted to talk about um, a couple of the different things that are up there so that you can peruse at your leisure and also hopefully um, find things that are useful to you in your conversations uh, and, and in your organization. Um, so next slide, please. Um, there are a number of graphics that um, hopefully provide information to you, but that you can use, um, you can print them, you can email them, you can use them in Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, whatever your social media um, of platform of choice is, uh, and use that as a way to, um, to get some of this information out. Um, so those are, those are on our website um, at the link that is above. Um, and. Uh, Jessica, you and your team now have these slides, so feel free to send them around and people can, can just click. Uh, but next slide, please. Um, a number of um, in for a number of sites uh, on the website also explaining where you can go to get vaccinated. Um, so there is a map and it is searchable. Uh, you can put in your zip code and uh, see what is close to you if you are currently eligible to get um, a vaccine. Um, you can use this map to help you. Uh, and if you were just listening to the governor's press conference, um, then you likely know we also have a phone line available now to help folks um, uh, if if the web is not uh, the best tool for them uh, and they don't have another option for signing up online, there is now um, a phone line available to, to help folks. Um, there are different colors on the map and it's explained on the website, but um, the mass vaccination sites that are open to everyone uh, are in red. And so those have been um, announced, for example, Gillette was the first one, Fenway just opened. Um, then there are, it looks blue, but I'm pretty sure on the website it's green, but there are then public vaccination sites that are um, at locations that might feel slightly more comfortable to people, including pharmacies. So um, not as big as, for example, Gillette, but maybe uh, a Walgreens or a local CVS or a local um, uh, health system satellite that, that has um, clinics available. Um, UMass Amherst uh, had a bunch of clinics over the past couple of weeks, for example. Um, and so those, those are really terrific geographically. Um, and then the yellow are restricted, um, not open to the whole Commonwealth, but restricted either based on geography. So for example, uh, some uh, local boards of health who want to vaccinate their community, but don't feel like they have capacity to vaccinate everybody in the Commonwealth, and so limiting it. Um, or uh, some other um, health uh, system uh, type sites that again are limited, but that information is, is there uh, on, on the website. And so hopefully you can find some information about that. Um, and additional sites as well as appointment slots um, get, get added regularly. So if you don't 
find something that you are looking for today, uh, try back next week. Um, and I believe, but please don't quote me on it, that the mass vaccination sites release new appointments every Thursday. Um, so um, that, that may also be just something to check in on if you are looking. Next slide, please. Um, back to uh, some more information that is up on our website. Um, and I imagine um, that this was already discussed on this webinar in terms of the content, but we do have posters, graphics, FAQs, um, and they are translated into 10 different languages. So we do have multilingual translation up on the website for these flyers and posters. Um, and so please feel free to print um, or to email out um, for, for folks um, that English is not a first language. Uh, definitely wanting this to, uh, to be as accessible as possible. Um, we also are looking um, to uh, uh, release um, very shortly our public um, communications campaign. And so that will have more information on the radio um, and other ways to reach people, not just um, visually. We'll have more um, audio. So for folks, again, just reaching people in different ways and, and in different spaces. Um, next slide, please. And I recognize we are coming to time. Um, but if you are interested in hosting a forum um, for your community or your uh, organization or stakeholders, there is a, a PowerPoint that is up on our website. And um, you are welcome to use these slides. Um, hopefully, they can be helpful for you. You can adapt them um, for what makes sense for your organization. We also just released yesterday an announcement that next week and the week after, we are hosting webinars that will kind of be train the trainers. So we will walk through how to use this PowerPoint and ways in which you might be able to adapt it to work for you. Um, Jessica, if you and your team did not get that, I will um, email that to you, and then you can send that out for folks. Um, but again, an hour next week and an hour the week following to talk about um, hopefully how to use some of these materials in a way that might be helpful for you. Um, next slide, I think, is the last one. Um, so uh, these are uh, live links. And so um, again, hopefully Jessica's team can send this around because then you can just click on them. But for uh, more of this information, these are the places on our website to, um, to get you some of this detail and hopefully some of these resources that can um, that can help you. Um, I will pause. I will end there, and then Jessica, any questions uh, in our last few minutes? Happy to take, and happy to follow up afterwards as well. Okay, great, Lindsay. Thank you so much. That was terrific, and I know a ton of information. I appreciate the equity angle, and both from a race and ethnicity perspective, but also obviously from a regional rural, suburban, urban perspective as well. A couple of specific questions people are asking, what about folks that are receiving chemotherapy? Is that considered a comorbidity? When you said pregnancy was considered, someone asked is chemotherapy. I, um, pregnancy was just top of mind because of yeah. my last meeting. So I don't okay. have the full list in front of me, but I right. do believe a current cancer diagnosis is on the list. Okay. Um, and so, um, I would like to follow up before I am quoted in any yep, way on that, that's but fine. I, um, can, can send you the full list um, that we have from the CDC of folks at greatest risk. Okay. Um, and if, if anybody knows that off the top of your head, please jump in. But I do believe um, current cancer is, is, is on it. Okay. And then another question specific in this phase two for homebound residents, is there specific information they can get to, su to support their access? That's a, that's a really great question. So um, it meaning if you are um, over 75 and homebound, what is an, yeah, okay, great. So we are working on, um, on some options so that the vaccine can come to you. Um, and there will be more information when we have that, but recognizing that there are a number of people that um, for a variety of reasons cannot um, easily leave the house and that there will need to be um, mobile vaccination um, and and have um, have the vaccine come to you. Uh, okay. So more information to come there, but absolutely something that we are recognizing um, as as a need and one that we um, will need to be filling. Okay. And then another very specific question: Someone's asking, can you get a shot in Massachusetts and in Connecticut or New Hampshire? What's the feedback on on that? Yeah, um, so it is strongly recommended that you get your first and your second dose from the same location, um, mm -hmm. but you don't have to. Um, so uh, 
it is easier for us to track if you get it in the same location and if you get it in the same state. Um, but there is a, a national um, system, and when you get your first vaccine, um, you will get a card um, letting you know so that you know which vaccine you got and when you need the second one, and you can then use that. So if you happened uh, to get an appointment in New York uh, and now are eligible in Massachusetts for your second vaccine, um, you, you can certainly use that card. Um, and just, again, you need to be sure that you are getting um, the same version of the vaccine. So if you right. got Moderna first, you need to get Moderna second. If you got Pfizer first, you need to get Pfizer second. That's very helpful. And then the last just couple of minutes, Dr. Hessler, I invite you and um, uh, Associate Commissioner Tucker to answer this, but for people who are feeling anxious and they're afraid in the last few moments, what is your advice? What are your recommend recommendations? What do you suggest to ease their fears and feelings about the COVID-19 vaccine? Doctor, I defer to you. Um, <laughs> So I would recommend uh, first and foremost to, to, um, to educate yourself around the safety of the vaccination and to talk to um, trusted sources around it. So your own personal healthcare provider, uh, as well as um, people that you know uh, who have been vaccinated. <laughs> um, so there, you know, many, many, many healthcare workers in our community now are vaccinated because we all went first. Um, and um, so there was, I think, a little trepidation there um, among um, healthcare workers because although it was really exciting to be given access to the vaccine, you're going first, right? And so you don't know whether or not um, there's going to be uh, anything bad that happens. Um, and so I think that a lot of our um, healthcare workers were anxious at first, but then as they saw their colleagues uh, getting the vaccine and uh, doing fine with it, and then um, being really excited that now um, there's sort of light at the end of the tunnel, there's some hope for us out there. Um, really helped to um, bolster confidence in it. Uh, and again, uh, the more that you, um, you know, the more that you know about this, uh, the, the more I think that people will feel comfortable with it. Knowledge is power. Um, and so knowing, knowing what you're, uh, what you're up for is, uh, can I think help people feel more comfortable. Great. Thanks, Lindsay. Do you want to add anything? Uh, no, I, I think that was incredibly well said. Um, okay. And we uh, recognize that it's, it's um, a journey um, and some folks uh, might not feel comfortable today, but might feel comfortable tomorrow. And um, so we just really wanna be sure that uh, when you are eligible, the vaccine is available for you and that um, you, can, you can access it when you are ready for it. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much, Lindsay, for joining. No, you're very busy. And like you said, it's a journey and things are coming out you know, every day and we'll be sure to post information as we can. And Dr. Hessler, thank you so much uh, again for your time and your leadership and Dr. Westlake behind the scenes who's been answering questions on, on the live stream and Senator Lesser, if you're still with us, thank you so much. Um, we will post the slides, we will post the link in the recording. Uh, we will continue to push out information and try to educate with other folks in, in our region. There's a couple of webinars coming up in the city of Springfield over the next two weeks, and we will uh, have those uh, dates and times on our, on our website as well being done by other groups. So thank you everyone, we're, we're beyond our time and we appreciate you so much for joining us today. So take care of yourself and your loved ones. And uh, thank you again.